I wouldn't really consider myself a problem solver, but problems are always first and foremost in my creative process. In the last few years, I've dealt with issues such as fair dealing in Canadian copyright law, how to get instrumentalists to speak and play at the same time, and today's topic, how to approach something like disease through a piece of music. Central to my creative practice is the exploration of what I consider to be a commonly held misconception about music. Somewhere along the lines, we've gotten the idea that a composer can communicate directly with an audience through music. Now imagine, a couple hundred years ago, a composer writing by uh, candlelight, speaking directly to somebody listening on their iPod. As ridiculous as I think that that image is, there's plenty of examples of people with that kind of thought process. I remember after one performance, somebody came up to me to describe the images he saw while listening to my piece. A herd of bunnies running towards a cliff. <laughs> I couldn't help to smirk, not at the idea, because I thought it was really cool, but uh, to smirk at the idea. He was standing there fully expecting me to confirm that that's the exact image I wanted him to see. <laughs> I've also spoken to performers, one of whom was convinced I had embedded a secret message to them in my music. And of course, I'm guilty, myself, of imagining the audience's end reaction while I'm writing the piece. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining about any of these things. These images and these messages, they add to my music, and they are a vital part of the musical experience. That's the experience held by anyone creating, performing, or listening to music. You see, there's the composer, then there's the performer, and then there's the audience. Each one is desperately trying to communicate their thoughts to the next one. Now here's the really exciting part, because that misconception about communicating from me to you, it's not actually a problem. In fact, uh, it's this obsession with communication that makes composed music such an ideal format for sincere musical expression. So when a composer writes a note a little bit longer, or a performer gestures on a phrase, or someone sitting next to you sighs. All of those things contribute to a deeper musical experience. So with all of those things that I talked about, uh, it's not actually the composer's notes that move you to tears. Right? Uh, the, the furthest a composer can actually reach is to write the music well enough that a performer has an authentic experience playing that piece. From there, the audience has an empathetic reaction to watching that performer play the piece of music. So in the absence of direct communication, there's actually this wonderful opportunity for uh, experiential influence. Coming to that understanding was a huge part in writing the piece I'm going to play for you today, Alzheimer's Variations. So for my grandmother's memorial, I played a short piece on the piano that I had written in her honor. Uh, after after the, uh, the memorial, a great aunt came up to me to thank me, saying, you couldn't have summed her up better. That piece really was Isabel. After the funeral, um, that tune really stuck with me, and so did my great aunt's words. If that piece of music was my grandma, then how would it be affected by Alzheimer's? So here, meet my grandma. There she is. I really, before the piece actually became her, I wanted to I really wanted to sum her up in, in her prime. She was the kind of woman who uh, would never be able to leave the house without meeting somebody she knew and make them smile. So my task in this piece, in order to make the piece go through the, uh, the experience of 
Alzheimer's, was to create a platform through which both the compo uh, sorry, both the piece of music and the person playing it went through the stages of Alzheimer's. So that's where we come in. In the first variation, I ask the performer, which in this case is myself, separate from the composer, I ask them to make mistakes. And I make those mistakes by drawing big red circles directly on the score, as you can see. But by not specifying what kind of mistake to make, we get to the theme of, uh, of, this, of this event, the performer has to make the piece their own, thus taking the first step into experiencing Alzheimer's. In the second variation, click, uh, again, I draw big red circles and ask them to make mistakes. This time, and it's not written on the score, but I've asked them to play slower and to try not to make mistakes. It's a frustrating experience for the pianist playing, and it actually shows. Good. In this variation, in the left hand, the performer's left hand stays perfectly in time, just like the world around them, while the right hand, you can see there's breaks in the score. The right hand is falling in and out of sync. In this variation, I'm, I have to say, I'm so glad that my grandma never experienced the bursts of anger and violence that are common amongst uh, Alzheimer's patients. But for this, for this pianist's journey, they're an important stage. In the final stages of Alzheimer's, all that's left are fading glimpses of the, of the patient's former self. Uh, while there's still references to the theme here, it's obvious that the music and the performer have become something completely different. <laughs> 